Good evening and welcome to episode 125 of the Age of Futures podcast. We're delighted to be joined this evening by Professor Rachel Lofthouse. Rachel is a Professor of Teacher Education and Director of Collective Ed at Leeds Beckett University. Yeah, Rachel has 30 years experience as a teacher, teacher educator, writer and researcher. He's working weekly with students, teachers and school leaders, as well as being involved in a range of European projects. She is passionate about professional learning that crosses boundaries, brings educators from different sectors together and respects individual motivations and authentic concerns that drive change. I don't know about you guys, just going to break it there. It feels weird not having cameras on. I, I, I'm like, I don't know what to do here. I'm normally going, right, Rachel, she's top left in the corner. Welcome, Rachel. But I'll have to do it without anybody being able to see. How are we doing, Rachel? I'm absolutely fine, thank you. Yeah, so... Do you want to explain a little bit in regards to what Collective Ed actually is and what it looks like uh, at the university? Oh, I can. What does it look like? Well, there is a single plaque outside my office door, which I haven't seen for a year, um, and it says Collective Ed. Um, what it is, is a network of practitioners, uh, researchers and of course uh, quite a lot of people cross that boundary in their own lives they are master students doctoral students they are teachers who engage in and with research um, but it's a network of practitioners and researchers all of whom have a shared interest in coaching and or mentoring and or supporting professional learning and development and all of whom also are concerned about the teaching profession um, across all sectors and the well-being of teachers. Cool. Yeah. I like it's it. That... Sorry, Steve. It's weird not okay. being able to see you because yeah. that, that would be able to get some visual cues. Sorry. Yeah, um, it sounds really good. Um, and it sounds like that whole um, caring about teacher well-being is something that's obviously a massive, um, massive part of this uh, and about teacher development. And I think hearing that that that's kind of central to what this happens is, is really like music to all of our ears who, who care about teachers and are watching teachers struggling now um watching teachers getting harangued in the press as as, as schools being closed and all that nonsense that we hear so yes yeah, it's, it's kind of like music to the ears yeah and it is uh, you know we're not specialists in well-being or mental health but what we are all interested in is that is that intersection between how teachers work and learn and how they feel about the job they're doing and how they fit the job they're doing into their other uh, wider personal lives. Because if you can't fit that job in um, and you don't feel good about that job, then it's very difficult to thrive. And obviously what we're all interested in is the very best outcomes for children and young people and they cannot possibly be achieved if we've got a profession that is fragmented or on its knees or on the way out. Fortunately, we know that, you know, the vast majority of teachers hang in there um, and they really do um, pull miracles out of, <laughs> out of dust. Um, and we're there to help and support them, but also to understand how they do it so that we can share that practice with others through, through research. It's really interesting, isn't it? Like one of the we, we talk about kind of the impact that that lockdown and, and and school buildings closing has had on education in the wider world. But one one of the massive kind of side effects is, and I don't know if, if you're saying this as well, Rachel, is that teachers are, are kind of taking back ownership of their own CPD in terms of going out onto the internet, finding webinars and kind of the amount of, of free CPD that, that seems to be out there now um is 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 amazing and and it, it being in the second being in a secondary school and kind of having that perspective there's so many teachers now just going off and finding their own cbd and actually spending their own time doing it as well yeah i was talking about that earlier on actually um and i think it's it's a really am amazing phenomenon um i think there are we are right to welcome a huge kind of plethora of you know, providers, whether those are formal providers or individuals who have stories to share and um, ideas and practice to share into the ecology, if you like, of professional learning. I think the more people access that um, and access that 
if you like, under their own steam, motivated by their own interests, the more discerning teachers and school leaders will become of what it is that's truly supportive and helpful and groundbreaking, if that's what they're looking for. Um, hopefully, that means that they'll join lots of dots in their own practice and with their own colleagues. And hopefully that creates greater capacity in the system. It, it does feel sometimes like a bit of a Wild West. It's not always all that easy to discern, you know, what the credibility is of different CPD provision. But I do think most teachers are highly intelligent people and can quite quickly make judgments regarding that. Yeah, and I think we're, we're seeing, especially what I've noticed is, is then kind of just the teachers coming back into the school or the college with their own ideas and wanting to influence the direction that teaching and learning is going on. So it's almost like it's 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 starting like a bottom up um, kind of mini revolution within within what teachers how teachers continue to train themselves. So it's not, because I think in recent years and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this that we seem to have got a a lot of top down this is this is what we're gonna this is what we're gonna train on this is how we because this is how we want the direction of the college or the school to go but now to seeing teachers coming back in after going exploring and doing their own research and doing their own cpd stop maybe starting to influence it and that, and i think anytime you have that bottom-up approach it's quite exciting i think it is and i think there's lots of possible ripple effects um and one of those, and I really hope this comes about, is a recognition by teachers about, if you like, the potential avenues and ways in which people learn. Um, and I know that sometimes we like to differentiate between children of different ages or children versus adults. Um, but if we start to, to connect um, the ideas that teachers gain and the way in which teachers gain those ideas through more informal networks, through inquiring for themselves about what they're interested in, seeking out opportunities, then it is possible that that will begin to influence the way they see opportunities for their own learners evolving and opening up. This sounds like amazing that teachers can have some kind of autonomy about their own development. And I know that's something that Steve's really passionate about in terms of, uh, he talks quite a lot about personalization of um, professional development, that it's not just that one size fits all, that everybody has to do the same stuff um, as, as if like you've been teaching 20 years and you need the same thing as somebody who's been teaching too. Uh, it, 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 that kind of notion is, is still prevalent in schools and colleges, isn't it? I wonder, I wonder if there's, um, there is a danger though, and I'm not saying this is the case or whether it's my opinion or not. I'm just trying to just look at the other side as well, is that if if you have lots and lots of voices into this is how we should develop and this is what we should try. So this this group says we should do Kagan and this people this group says we should look at thinking hats and these people think we should do X, Y, and Z, does it does it dilute um if we're going if we if we get a bit too broad? Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, I think I think what we have to do is we have to become more comfortable with diversity of expertise um, in education. We have to acknowledge that learners are likely to thrive when they come across teachers who are able to each offer something that's unique. Um, that's well suited to the curriculum area. You know, there's no, you can't detach uh, the, the approaches to pedagogy to the nature of the curriculum um, and is also well suited to the individual learners, but is not um, slavishly driven by a formula which somebody has assumed is the correct way to teach young people in 2021. Um, and that actually, the diversity that educators can bring um, really could be an enriching element of the school experience for young people. And, and I'm, what I'm not saying here is that children and young people should just be exposed to pure random acts of teaching. You know, that they, they, get, they get, you know, into a head spin because they absolutely cannot predict what they're coming to next when they walk into somebody's classroom. 
Um, that, that wouldn't help anybody. But I do think that if we narrow down our understanding of what effective teaching is, and whether that is as a whole collective, you know, persuaded, for example, by the DfE, or um, by an institution, um, you know, perhaps, um, you know, as a result of anxiety by a senior leadership team about consistency and continuity, then what we're likely to do is deprive children and young people of some of the opportunities that would exist if they were expo exposed to more diversity. The key thing always, of course, is gaining insight into where the expertise lies and continuing to build that expertise as opposed to just randomly throwing out there any old tactic for teaching that, that you come across. Do you know, I think that's that's interesting there as well, where where it came to be that you, you don't just do anything. It's not necessarily you just throw anything at students. It's that it's that um, experiential um, or research informed, or it, it, it's got some kind of grounded and somebody's thought about this. You're not you're not just going to go and throw anything at, at somebody. Yeah, I, I like that. I like the idea that it's got to have some kind of grounding and it's been thought through um i suppose i suppose there's that that cultural element as well of that like that learning is is part of our profession I'm, I'm conscious that um i was uh for well actually i still am but uh for 12 years nearly 12 years i i taught religious studies and i i went on one in that whole 12 years i went on one subject specific uh, development uh, course because the, the school wouldn't fund it so anything that i needed to know about what was developing in in in, in ideas around religion or, or or philosophy or ethics i kind of only had to do that in my own research because the school didn't invest in that for me as a subject spe uh, specific development and i wonder whether there's there's a need for that in schools yet we talk about lots of ideas around this is the new behavior management strategy or this is the new um, where to check progress or questioning skills or feedback or whatever else perhaps there's that element around subject specific development as well yeah absolutely I, I think it, it's um it's absolutely essential that teachers feel entirely comfortable with the curriculum that they're teaching and that they also acknowledge that the subject um expertise behind that curriculum will be continuing continuing to evolve the discipline is always evolving so one of their responsibilities is to ensure that they feel um, on top of that curriculum area so their subject expertise is really critical um, I, I think however that there are really effective ways in which we can blend developing subject expertise with developing, for example, pedagogic approaches. And probably finding those dual perspectives is what's necessary um, because it's both areas that teachers rely upon. Um, and if we, if we divorce one from another, then it, we're expecting teachers to do all the joining up for themselves as opposed to supporting that joining up process all the time. And I'll just give you an example of that. So when I was um, a secondary teacher, um, I was a geography teacher, I was really fortunate that both the local authority that I worked in at the time and the local university that I'd been connected to because I was a mentor and I'd done my own PGCE there were facilitating networks of subject teachers who were... Uh, and this was in the 1990s, so we were interrogating the new national curriculum, the first version of the national curriculum, and trying to really make sense of how we could bring that alive um, through teaching and learning. And one of the approaches that we really focused on was what we called at the time teaching thinking skills, but not teaching thinking skills as a standalone um, project, but teaching thinking skills really carefully and intelligently infused within the subject. So we became much better geography teachers because we really thought hard about the types of thinking that doing geography required. That if you were thinking geographically, these were the types of thinking skills and these were the broad 
concepts that helped you understand the subject. And these were the sorts of pedagogic approaches that really brought those all together in one place and enhanced learning and attainment in the subject. And when we really focused in on that in a network over the course of several years, we made some really significant strides in the quality of our own teaching, in the, you know, the grades, let's put it bluntly, that our pupils gained, in their progression, for example, onto A-level courses, and also were able to share the expertise that we gained trial and error over time and, and, and peer review of each other's work in a series of books which other people still use 20 years later. So I think, you know, there is such an important place for subject knowledge development for any teacher, whether you're primary or secondary or FE, but that actually as teachers combining that with thinking really hard about pedagogy is really critical. Yeah, definitely. I think um, w w we are endangering some aspects of that cultivating crop too much of, of, of compliance um, with teachers um, to, to ensure that um, because of the boundaries and the expectations from external sources to schools um, that we will cultivate because we know that that will tick the box potentially, which is such a fearsome thing because um, outstanding practice looks very, very different from geography lesson to geography lesson, from teacher to teacher, from actual lesson to lesson, from the way that we deliver. And I think that's so important. Um, I want to touch upon Joe, what you mentioned around mentoring. Um, and we talked about staff picking their own CPD um, and, and the choice and the diversity of that, but also the importance um, of the role that you've played and the role that Collective Ed is, is playing around mentoring and coaching in education and the power of that, that, I've done a PGC. We've, we're all sitting here. We've, we've done postgraduate certificate of education, and and I remember not only my lessons, but the the strength of the person that was supporting me, that was going through, that had been through and and got the scars, but and and the the support that they gave me, not only on a on a on a PGC, but also in in all aspects of of professional development. How important do you think it is around having a mentor or coaching system internally or externally to support people's development so they can be sh their professional development and their learning can be shaped correctly so they ha they are guided um, through their choices Rachel I think it's really important it, it if we're thinking about kick-starting people's careers um, it's it's essential to have somebody who can begin to know you really well as an early practitioner who can you know, formatively assess how you're doing, constructively give you feedback, help you um, join, for example, subject communities because they're part of those communities or help you feel comfortable in, in the setting that you're in and, you know, join the dots. Again, I'm always talking about joining dots. You know, the mentor may know that um, one of the things you're struggling with, for example, is, is behaviour management um, and they will inevitably be able to give you support and advice but they may also know of other colleagues who they can direct you to so go and watch these two or three other teachers you'll see that they actually all work within the if you like the conditions of the school the regulations of the school but they also all bring their own unique personalities and relationships to bear in the in the classes that they teach so you know um, a mentor can become a really important broker of experiences for an early career teacher and I think it's actually really essential that that's part of the mentoring or in or indeed coaching practice that it doesn't become if you like a, a highly codependent relationship that it, it acts as a gateway into other opportunities for professional learning. But always is the backstop, is, is somebody who you know as an early career teacher or as a trainee teacher that you can rely on to go back to, to say, can you help me with this? Have you got five minutes for me to mull this over with you? Or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that I've had a really hard day and I want to know it's all right. So can you tell me it's going to be all right tomorrow? And I think it, it's that that it's that social relational 
um, aspect that a mentor or a coach can bring into what is just an extraordinarily frenzied experience. And we all need somebody like that, whatever stage of career we're at, but particularly at the beginning. Yeah, to totally agree. And I think it's that um, differentiation and, and there are flip flops between the two, the differentiation between a coach and a mentor, um, the support mechanism, but also the framing of, especially for, for those people who have just gone into practice, just out of, um, of, of their training and saying, I just want to get better. And here's a list of 10 things that I want to improve over, over the next few weeks. And then it's reshaping and reframing. So what, what should we start with and how, Let's explore that a little bit in terms of what let's unpick it. I think is so important, and and it's a it's a, a big skill base. Um, so how how do we improve that um, across our teaching profession, but also within schools? Do you think do you think there's enough of it that goes on? Um, or I know that that's why. But do, yeah, how, do we think there's enough of it? How do we improve it? I think there's quite a lot goes on under the radar informally, uh, un unrewarded, unnoticed. Um, you know. People tend to gravitate towards colleagues who will be of help to them and who for whom they find, you know, interest in having conversations with. And I think that's great. And we shouldn't we sh shouldn't try and take that away. Um, I think that um, inevitably, if you're following a formal program of training um, or now with the early career framework coming, if you're in that induction period, there is an allocation, there's an obligation, if you like, for the organisation that you work for to provide you with somebody who is going to act on your behalf to help you to gain um, greater confidence and a, a wider repertoire of, of skills. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's really essential that funding uh, resource and time is put into that, including into the training and development of those people. Um, I worry that... We, we often say mentors, for example, are essential and they're, if you like, they're woven into the fabric of this new programme. But a lot of assumptions are made about who the best mentors might be or how able they are to fit mentoring in to the rest of their day job. I don't think we give, um, at the moment, adequate um, credit to the work that mentors do. Um, and I think we can, all of us, work harder to do that because I think what we're really in need of is almost a, um, not a subgroup within the profession, but a, 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 almost like a second professional status. So I think, you know, teacher and mentor with mentor being as significant in somebody's role and role identity as teacher or teacher and coach, um, with the coach being as significant for them and in, in the way that their role is shaped um, for them and uh, enabled for them. I think, I think it's really important that we really raise the profile of those aspects of work. And I'm not saying that because I happen to be, if you like, just simply wedded to the idea of coaching and mentoring as the answer to everything, because it, it isn't. Um, but I do know, um, and we see evidence of it from both practice and research, that when coaches and mentors are well developed in terms of their practice and are well deployed, then they can make the world of difference. And they can make the world of difference both in an integrated fashion, so as part of a, you know, a, a CPD program uh, where there's a mentor allocated or a coach allocated to support your development through that work, or in a more informal and organic fashion. You know, for example, where somebody finds their own coach finds their own mentor and works with them for a period of time. So I do think it's a really um, important um, direction of travel. And I think it's slightly bizarre that given we, that we are the educators and we work in a, an education sector, that some other industries have gone a lot further on that direction of travel. And have, have, if you like, have, have strided ahead, is that the word? Um, of us, I think we should be at the forefront of it, and it's a shame that we haven't been able to to do that. 
Yeah, we, we've uh, we've done a bit of work in the past. I've uh, been lucky enough to work with Drew Povey, uh, great guy, and, and kind of one of the main bits of advice he always he always tries to impart is uh, get yourself a mentor, no matter no matter what stage you're at, no matter what you're up to, just get yourself get yourself a mentor, and um, and it's one bit of advice that that kind of I took a, I, I took to heart anyway, and um, and and I've acted on it, um, and I think and I'm so glad I did. Uh, especially for self improvement, I, I just want to I want to change the gear a little bit now, Rachel, if that's all right, because I think anybody who who kind of knows what we we're talking about the initial teacher training and um, and kind of within the political landscape of 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 England and and the UK at the moment will know if they if they kind of read between the lines. Well, well, actually, you don't have to read between the lines if you, if they just keep up to date with with news. Uh, in this country, they'll realise that there's, there's a there's a conflict bubbling away underneath the surface that's kind of growing by by the month at the moment. And we have um, we've got Nick Gibb, um, an education minister, who um, has openly a few times claimed that he wants to take education out of the hand hands of the professors. Um, and we have just a few weeks ago the announcement of uh, the an intention to start the government to start their own uh, knowledge-based teacher training program um which i'm guessing is 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 their way of trying to do that uh what what's your thoughts on all of that that's that's bubbling away and do you think there's actually any legs in in kind of their intentions at the moment oh that's a that's a really good question <laughs> i think it's um it's a an absolute travesty that we are in a situation still 10 years on where the main policy for teacher education is to divide and rule rather than to work collaboratively so there's a huge amount of rhetoric around partnership um, but rather than really allowing those partnerships to flourish and to thrive over time and really examining the quality of them and the reasons for the quality and working to replicate best practice. There's a continual um, determined sense, I think, to invent new ways to spend government money to bring new teachers into the profession and to uh, control and influence the way in which they're trained um, I, I'm I've been a teacher educator for 20 years this year in two different institutions across two very different flavors of uh, government and there was no way that you would argue that pre-gove everything was perfect there were certainly some white elephants there were certainly some you know, blind alleyways that we went down. Um, but what there was, I think, was a very genuine appreciation that we were likely to create the best possible profession if we drew on the widest range of expertise to support that. Um, and you could have argued that there were quite a lot of um, static partnerships it, from the outside, it might have looked like things hadn't changed for a long time. But from the inside, I think those of us who worked in teacher education knew how profoundly hard we worked to generate genuine partnerships between, for example, universities and schools to really build up opportunities for people to work across those boundaries and to create programmes that really drew on the most expert knowledge that we could find um, and also provide opportunities for learning which centered new teachers as this is going to sound like a very old-fashioned word but as scholars as as people who needed to use their intelligence to go out into the education world whether that was in a university lecture theater or in a classroom where they were observing somebody teach or in their bedroom when they were planning tomorrow's lesson as a student teacher, or in the feedback they were getting from their mentor, to go out there and gather intelligence from every possible source and 
as they gathered that intelligence to then have the capacity and the opportunity and the support to use that intelligently so that they could become expert teachers. And I think that we are really at risk of denying some of those opportunities from teachers, new teachers, because we have begun to adopt and be told we have to adopt um, curriculum that has been constructed and defined by a relatively small group of people to meet what is considered to be the necessary demands of the curriculum in schools, which is itself defined by a relatively small number of people, and to work in cultures in schools, which may be, um, if you like, contemporary, they are what they are now, but may be entirely inappropriate in five or 10 years time. I do think the pandemic's dem demonstrating some of that. So I think we are really worried about some of the direction of travel. And we are, we have in the past been reassured that new initiatives and new provision and new programs and new investment in forms of teacher training or teacher education, as I'd much prefer to consider it, are not themselves a risk to best practice that's already there. But I don't think we are reassured that that's actually the case. Yeah, I mean, we've been told a few times by members of the government that they they, they don't want to listen to experts anymore. Um, and it, 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 uh, personally, I think it's, it's beggar's belief, really. And I know we last episode we had Bob Harrison on, who, who was utterly bewildered by the fact that when it came to online education, we we seem to we seem to be adamant to to reinvent the wheel over the last year and and disregard thirty years worth of experience by those professors who the government just seem to disregard and and I think it's really interesting when you talk about that divide and conquer um, methodology. Um, I think we see, we've we've kind of seen it recently as well with with the 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 York Academy, for example, in kind of setting up something completely new and I, and I think it was bob harrison who said that like surely you, you, your common sense says you for something like that you go you go straight to the open university you go to the people who've been doing it for years and who've got the experience and you've got the the research to back it up you don't just you don't have the the arrogance really to to think well i know better and i'll just i'll start from scratch uh, yeah and it's hard isn't it because if we uh, you know if we name individual projects then it starts to feel as if we're saying that the individuals involved don't have a right to contribute you know 100 yeah, percent completely um, and there's know, some amazing teachers who are contributing to, to Oak, Oak national amazing exactly. teachers but actually but what we didn't necessarily need was that structure and that funding route um to get the best outcomes um, that we that we needed, and I think, I mean, the whole you know we don't need experts is ridiculous. Not because you know it's not because all experts are infallible because nobody is, but the rhetoric of we don't need those experts is then very rapidly followed along by but we've got our own experts, we we've created experts. Our experts are now the people that you're obliged to engage with positively and don't you dare criticize them. They're the ones who will give you direction about how to do your job. And they're the ones who we will fund well um, in order to, you know, create an infrastructure that will become very influential. So I, I don't buy any of that. We don't need experts. And the, one of the reasons I don't buy it is because they basically say, these are your experts now. It's just, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah, and, and yeah, um, I said I won't go political, so I'm not. Um, yeah, I think that whole rhetoric. Whatever, of, whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to dodge it. I'm going to dodge it. Um, unless, uh, otherwise we might release uh, Twitter Rachel rather than, uh, and, and Rachel might dive into something and she's doing a great job of, 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 of not being political, which I, which I do like. It's not so much um, that I just don't need to be personal. I don't think we need to be personal no. about the, but the, 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 I mean, I, I once, okay, so the, once upon a time, I was headline news in the student newspaper at the university I worked in. 
Um, and the reason I was headline news is because a young conservative member who happened to be on the teacher education program took offence at a statement I made in a lecture. And the statement I made uh, was related to education being used as a political football. Um, and that, um, it, you know, that education was political. Um, you know, the act of educating is a political act. The decisions that we make are political, but that didn't mean it should be used as a political football. Um, and I and, and that particular student took offence, um, wrote a letter of complaint to the head of school, you know, got frontline. I mean, not very many people were reading this student newspaper, but it was still quite a shock to be on it. And it, it was just, you know, just such a an odd situation to be in because actually having said um, it shouldn't be a political football, but it is political, it was then being used as a political football. <laughs> um, so it is, uh, education is a political act. Um, we have to acknowledge that, I think. Yeah, I think we discussed a couple of episodes ago, just exploring around what would it look like if, if um, governments um, obviously invested, uh, but actually there was a an a collective or a, or a group of, of of people that helped shape it with a with a long term vision rather than it, it changing. And I know, like you said, it it wasn't perfect under last government, and it, it, it and it isn't perfect under this. But actually, how can we collectively, uh, through coalition, through collective, through collaboration, through circles, whatever we want to call it, get a better outcome by looking at a long term vision of what education should be the focus? Um, because I just think. Um, well, the one thing that I've learned through the pandemic is um, potentially a lot of education in, in England has, has become focused on if we don't have exams, then there's no need for learning anymore. And I think that's just from my point of view, where I come from, my beliefs, my values are that I just think it, it, it makes me shake my head and it, it makes me worry that uh, what, what, what are we trying to achieve if, if that's the end goal? And I know that we need... Uh, measures and I know that we need assessment but it, we shouldn't have see uh, people falling off a cliff edge in terms of their learning saying we don't need to do it anymore if there isn't exams and I think that's something that's been been there and played out over quite a few years now and I think it needs yeah. to change it and really I does. The really interesting um, kind of exposure of that is how when I mean, I've got a nephew who's in year 11 I've got friends who've got children in year 11 you know I hear about other people's children on Twitter for example and I think you know 15, 16 year olds have all reacted in their own unique and particular way to the, you know, first of all, to that announcement that the exams this year wouldn't go ahead. And then to the model, we're still obviously in a significant model about it. Um, and the fact that, you know, some young people are absolutely devastated that they're not going to have an opportunity to demonstrate what they know in their exams where while other young people are utterly delighted that they're not going to have to be put through that in order to have credit for what they know. Um, and some people may be a bit ambivalent and confused. You know, there's all sorts of reactions. I think the fact that we have got those very um, polarised reactions from the young people themselves illustrate how substantial a sway the exam system has over their entire secondary education. Um, I, you know, I'm not saying they shouldn't react, of course they should, but it's only part of the jigsaw of their learning. And yet, inevitably, it evokes such immense emotional reactions and anxieties or relief. Um, and, and that tells me that we have narrowed our practices far too much around assessment. I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. We definitely have, have narrowed that. It's it's something that we. <laughs> these two are going to laugh. I'm glad I can't see the faces actually, um, because I harp on about there's nothing wrong with exams. There's nothing wrong with endpoint assessment as long as it is not the only measure. Um, and I think that's the key, isn't it? That which what we're trying to suggest that it's not. It can be a measure. It's not not it. Despite our fearless leader, Mr. Williamson, believing it's the uh, the fairest and, and best way to uh, to to assess pupils, um, it, 
it shouldn't be the only way. And I think that's what I think that's mm. where where we're saying, isn't it? And I think the other thing which is really revealing about it is how. Um, okay, so I, I you know I'm 52 this month. It's a long, long time since I was teaching full time um, in a secondary classroom. But in the 10 years that I taught, um, I, I, I taught in a high school and a sixth form college with a bit of year seven, eight and nine um, along the way. Uh, but most of my classes were exam classes. Most of them were hundreds, hundreds of A-level kids every year. It was hard work. Um, but um, the um, and there were syllabus and specification changes, even in those 10 years. You know, we went through several versions. Um, but the exam system, um, when I left for both GCSE and A-level, were modular and included coursework. Um, and the coursework in geography involved fieldwork. Now, you know, there's all sorts of arguments you could have about whether that's, you know, a really important priority in geography or not. You could have all sorts of arguments about the pros and cons of modular exams, the ability to resit, you know, the AS, then the A2, all of the things that were going on there. Of course you could. But one of the things that we as teachers had invested in us and invested time in was getting better at assessing our pupils' learning and being confident that when we went through a moderation process, for example, around coursework, that it was fair. Um, and we didn't shy away from that. You know, we, we recognised it as part of our workload. Um, and we also recognised it as a way to really... Um, create interesting learning experiences for our pupils that we had some control of because we weren't waiting for that exam paper to be open to see what was on the test. We were able to craft those fieldwork experiences, those coursework structures, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And that, that really intimate relationship that we had as teachers with the assessment process, with the crafting of learning opportunities that led to that assessment process, and with the moderation of that and its contribution to an overall grade was really part of our professional identity and we were skilled at it. Now okay some people might have begrudged the time it took, some people might have felt less confident um, and only gained confidence over time but what we now have is a generation of teachers who don't have that confidence and that skill set um, and that's not their fault. It's because they haven't ever been asked to dedicate time and effort to it. And because over time they've been, if you like, controlled into a system that doesn't even allow for modular exams. Um, so everything becomes this endpoint. So, and we also have the youngest generation of teachers in the whole of Europe. So we have a lot of teachers who didn't even, who, who've had similar school experiences that they're now generating for their pupils. So it, it what, what ama what no it doesn't amaze me but what worries me is how quickly we lose our professional memory and we lose the positive legacy of the things that we used to do well in the past when we most need them they're not there to draw upon and this i think is a good example of that and it's also a good a good reason why mentoring and coaching that brings together different generations of teachers can be really powerful in maintaining that professional memory and maintaining the legacy of the good practices um, that we know have existed. Yeah, I agree. I think we're all uh, we're all waiting for each other to jump in there. Steve, did you want to did you want to say something there? Uh, yeah, I was just going to. I know that your uh, a lot of your work is 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 looking at European projects as well and and bringing experiences in and 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 um, collaboration across. Um, countries how does that influence in terms of i don't always want to be the person who says how can we learn from others but is there not potentially but is getting right but what have we learned and what can we apply um and do better is there any things that we're doing better but also is there things that um, potentially we can learn from uh, that you've seen oh goodness there's um well we could start listing all sorts of things um if you like doing top trumps of different countries with different um aspects of education I think the most important thing that we can learn from others is that there are others working in education who have other approaches that are equally as effective as ours or potentially even more effective. 
And I think one of the problems that we have often is that if we point towards another jurisdiction and say, look what they're doing over there. So we had a good example of that yesterday on Twitter. There was a short video released of a school in Finland. And it was about the building and about how that building generated opportunities for collaborative uh, project work, for example, for mixed age classes and all sorts of things. And inevitably, um, there were a series of responses to that, um, some of which I saw. Um, and per m many of them were perfectly valid. So, you know, some people said I would have hated to be at school in a building like that. Some said I couldn't teach in a building like that. Some said that would be wonderful if we could. I would love to, you know, adopt those sorts of, um, you know, holistic approaches, in which which combine building curriculum and pedagogy in different ways to the way that we do it. And you know, everybody's opinion is valid. Everybody's experience is valid. But what we can't deny is that the way we do things here is the only way to do things here and the things that we can imagine resulting from the way things we do things here are the only possible futures um, for education and the, the greatest benefit to me personally and I hope that I can share with others by bringing them into projects or talking about projects is just that recognition that there are so many good ways to provide education and that we can always learn from others and that we don't need to be um, if you like denied our imagination as educators that actually that imagination is really really important and of course we can argue that some types of schooling work in some cultures because of the culture as opposed to because of the schooling but what we can also start to interrogate is the extent to which types of schooling create cultures that go beyond the school walls, that become intergenerational, that become societal. And I think we can really start to explore that in a way which is, which is both really you know, exciting and also highly productive. And I'd love to do that more, even more than I'm able to. Um, I really worry about Brexit, not just as a political uh, phenomenon, but because it has really practical repercussions on opportunities that teachers have. So, for example, we're currently working in an Erasmus project. The, one of the phases of that Erasmus project is bringing teachers together from six or seven different countries on training programmes. Our teachers in England will not be able to be funded through the Erasmus scheme because we're no longer in the Erasmus scheme. Whereas the teachers from the other countries will all be able to be funded to attend those training opportunities. And little things like that close doors and that's not very helpful. Uh, Professor Rachel, it's been great to have you on the show and just to, to get your um, your expertise. And, and there I said it, um, I think personally, I think, and I, and I think I speak for Ben and Steve here, I think we as well that, that we do uh, value expertise and we do value experience and and we should we should work together we should work collaboratively um because that's because we all want the best for for our learners and when we start dividing amongst ourselves i think i think ultimately the the learners are going to be the ones that suffer uh unfortunately uh so it's been amazing to get to get your sobering thoughts and and, and your insights there rachel thanks for joining us it, you're welcome and and I feel like we kind of went on a bit of a sober end point, didn't we? But I do also believe that the most important thing we can do is celebrate each other as educators and, and open our hearts and minds really to each other as educators and, and collaborate in such a way that we learn to be the best we can be. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. And um, yeah, have a, have a lovely evening. Thank you. I will. I'm off to make my dinner now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Rachel. Cheers, Rachel. Thank you very much.